Welcome to Bastyr and Introduction to Naturopathic Medicine at Bastyr University. Our apologies for our slightly late start. We were having a few technical difficulties. Today, you are going to hear from Dr. Safia McCarter, who is both an ND, a practicing ND, as well as a best year faculty member and a part-time admissions advisor. She is going to explain to you the naturopathic medicine at Bastyr University. My name is Nancy Desmond and I'm the assistant director for admissions here at Bastyr and also a Bastyr um, ND admissions advisor. So Dr. McCarter, please start your show. Thank you so much, Nancy. And again, thank you all. Uh, for being with us today. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm an alum of uh, Bastyr University uh, two times, um, first having completed the ND program and second having completed the acupuncture program. Um, so we're going to get started talking about what naturopathic medicine is. Uh, and Yes, I'll be talking about this, um, you know, partially just from, you know, broader definitions and also from my own personal experience so that I'm not directly reading the slides um, to you all that are in attendance. Um, but with, with naturopathic medicine, it's really about getting to the root cause, um, utilizing, um, in my personal opinion, the best of both worlds. So utilizing uh, what science has to tell us, what the individual has to tell us, and using natural therapies when appropriate, and I want to emphasize that, and we'll talk about the therapeutic order a little bit later on in this presentation, um, but using natural therapies to address um, the manifestation of symptoms. Uh, addressing symptoms initially may be important in some cases, and I'll get into that a little bit later, but really we're searching for the root cause and supporting the body in its ability to utilize its own defense mechanisms to address illness um, and disease. So again, the addressing symptoms may be um, helpful in our initial approach, especially if they are, for example, if we're going to be uh, uh, helping the body to uh, heal and we understand how important sleep is in the healing process for the immune system, if symptom manifestation is preventing someone from sleeping, then that is going to overall hinder that person's progress. So we may need to suppress symptoms or address symptoms in that case so that the person may be able to sleep. Um, so that's what I mean when I say it is, it is sometimes important to initially address symptoms. But overall, the fundamental approach and idea and philosophy of naturopathic medicine is get to the root cause, what is causing those symptoms to manifest in the first place. We are rooted and grounded in some fundamental principles, and these principles guide us in our approach to uh, each case, each person that we're working with, and we're going to go through and talk about those principles uh, one by one. So starting with the first principle of do no harm, and this principle is not unique to naturopathic medicine. It is a principle that all healthcare practitioners abide by. Our particular um, interpretation of this, um, of this principle is recognizing that there can be some harm, depending on the methods used. Um, there can be some harm that is done by way of side effects. So if there is an opportunity for us, depending on where a person is presenting, to use a therapy that has fewer side effects, um, then that is the route that we want to go because we don't want to cause harm. Um, we may, again, when we talk about that therapeutic order, have to start a little bit higher up in that therapeutic order because that is going to produce the least harm for the person. So our goal overall is going to be to keep the patient safe, to keep the person safe, um, and also adhere to um, standard of care because we're going to be held to the same standards and have the same responsibilities as other practitioners, even though our approach may be a bit different. Um, so when possible, although it may be necessary from a larger point of view to address symptoms initially, we also recognize that a fever, for example, has a very specific purpose. 
Um, and so if we can allow a fever to safely progress to do its job, then we're not going to suppress it in that case. Um, if someone has a cough, a cough has a very specific purpose. So we don't necessarily all the time want to suppress that cough because it is getting things out of the body. Perhaps we want to address that symptom by making the cough more productive and making it more effective in its natural function of removing things um, from, the, from the lungs. I mean, moving to Principle number two, utilizing the healing power of nature. So we recognize that the body has its innate healing mechanisms. And what we want to do as naturopathic physicians is recognize those and support those. Um, so perhaps there is someone is more susceptible to disease because their own immune system is not functioning properly. And we want to look at why it's not functioning properly. We want to look at why that innate healing mechanism of the body isn't functioning properly and address um, those things that might be hindering it. So maybe it's sleep, maybe it's diet, maybe it's stress um, or some other disease process that's going on that's impacting um, the body's, body's ability to heal. So we want to address those. Um, and we also want to, at all times, recognize the connection between um, the body and the mind. We understand, and we'll get into this a little bit later when we start talking about the principle of treating the whole person, but recognizing that there is a connection between the mind and the body, and we need to not only address those things that are physical, but those things that are emotional and psychological as well. Um, with principle number three, finding the cause. Uh, so again, our aim as naturopathic physicians is to find the underlying cause and not just mask symptoms and treat symptoms. Um, there may be, again, I'll keep repeating this because I think it is worth repeating and important to repeat that in some cases, depending on where the person is, depending on what they're experiencing, depending on what their, what their life is like, um, perhaps they're in a, in, a, in a position where they have to talk quite a bit and having a cough um, is going to prevent them from doing, um, you know, completing a particular role or completing a particular um, task. We may want to suppress the cough in those instances, but fundamentally we want to get to the root. What is causing that cough in the first place? What have they been exposed to? Is there a matter of addressing a weakened respiratory system that we need to tonify? Uh, so, Whenever possible, we want to find the underlying cause of the disease and not just treat symptoms. Our, our goal is to be curative whenever possible. Doctor as teacher is one of my favorite principles. I think it is absolutely important um, in that we as naturopathic physicians in my role at, in my clinical practice, having a relationship with my patients is incredibly important. Um, understanding that we are in partnership with um, the folks that we're working with. Um, we know them. We have a certain level of expertise based on the nature of our training as physicians. And we're getting to know people in an extended amount of time in comparison to our conventional counterparts. However, that person, that individual has been in their body their entire lives. And so it's important for us to approach these cases, understanding the wealth of information that that individual has about their lived experience in their body and seeing where we can meet that information with what we have as practitioners. So, um, you know, just sort of um, dismantling the, the hierarchical roles that tend to exist in, in medicine, recognizing that there's a certain level of information that we're going to rely upon that's coming from the patient. And really, we're in this together to achieve optimal health. Um, so our goal is to give as much information as possible um, and so that folks feel more empowered and they have a sense of agency uh, when it comes to their own health and well-being. And as I mentioned earlier, with the principle of treat the whole person, moving on to our next principle, um, number five, uh, we recognize that there are a number of factors that contribute to disease, that contribute to um, health, um, and it may not always be a physical 
um, factor that is contributing to illness. There are psychosocial, emotional uh, contributing factors as well. And because we have an extended amount of time, generally um, a first office call, a, the first time a person comes in to see a naturopathic physician, that visit is going to be anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on how that, that practitioner has set up their practice with follow-up appointments being anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes. So as naturopathic physicians, we are uniquely positioned to be able to address other factors that are contributing to uh, uh, to illness. Uh, we can take the time to address, again, those psychosocial, emotional um, contributing factors so that we're, we're addressing the symptoms that someone is experiencing, their state of disease from multiple levels. Um, we try to consider as much as possible when we're working with patients. Uh, so moving on to principle number six, preventive medicine. We are in the business of preventing um, someone from progressing further along in a disease process or preventing that disease process from starting from the very beginning. We also want to make sure that through using that principle of docere or doctorist teacher that we're giving our patients enough information so that again, they can make informed choices about the things that they're doing in their lives, whether that be diet, lifestyle, or environment that have an impact on their, um, on their overall health. So if there's any way that we can, again, prevent um, or slow down someone's progression in a particular disease process, then we absolutely want to do that and also equip that individual with the skills that they uh, can use to lead a healthy and happy life. Um, our last principle, uh, number seven, is wellness. And that's the goal. We want to achieve a state of complete health through utilizing preventive medicine through look, treating the whole person and addressing other contributing factors of illness. Um, we want to achieve a state of wellness or return that individual to a state of wellness. So at this point, we're going to get into uh, some more information about those things that make naturopathic medicine unique, um, starting with education, then moving on to method use methods used in the patient approach. Uh, so in looking at the curriculum, so looking at the educational component first, our curriculum was revised in the fall of 2012. And what we have now is an integrated systems-based curriculum. And in this version of the curriculum, your clinical experience uh, has been increased and actually begins in your first year. So that while you're taking the bulk of your basic science courses in your first year, you also are able to, through having required clinical observation hours that you have to complete, you're able to see how what you're learning in your basic science classes manifests in the clinical encounter and why it makes sense that you're studying um, you know, in great detail the anatomy, the physiology, um, and biochemistry of the different systems. Uh, it also has been changed from the time that I was in the program uh, to a more active learning environment. So there is a bit of decreased seat time. So you have access to the information that's going to be covered in your classes before, beforehand. So they are able to preview. And when you get into the actual classroom, then because you have already review, preview, previewed, excuse me, that information, you're ready to be engaged in a more active learning format. Uh, so you're discussing some of the concepts and, and topics um, in that information in small groups and large groups, as well as um, in, in the form of cases. So again, it's a much more active learning format um, as compared to when I went through the program back in 2005. So the next slide is an outline of what you're going to be covering. So you'll see here the basic sciences um, and the clinical sciences. 
uh, you'll see that there are some similarities between naturopathic medicine and conventional medicine with regard to the basic sciences and the clinical sciences that you're learning. At the end of the day, we are physicians that are working with individuals, so we need to know and have a firm a grasp of anatomy, histology, physiology, biochemistry, as well as the clinical sciences. The next slide is a comparison, and this was a comparison of the our naturopathic medicine program and the uh, conventional medical program at the University of Washington School of Medicine. So again, you'll see some similarities in the number of hours that the number of credits, excuse me, for each of these areas. And in some areas, we have more in our curriculum than in the conventional uh, curriculum when it comes to the basic sciences. So again, some similarities. Again, at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're physicians. Um, so we have to have um, knowledge of these basic sciences. On the next slide, you'll see the clinical sciences or the therapeutic modalities, excuse me. And this is going to be where there is a more clear departure between conventional medicine or allopathic medicine as it is here on this slide in naturopathic medicine. So the previous slide, we saw the similarity in number of hours when it comes to the basic sciences. So that foundational information that you need. The departure um, again, is going to come in the form of how we approach cases and the modalities that we use when we are working with individuals. Um, so our therapeutic modalities, which we'll go into uh, in a little bit more detail a little later on, are listed here. Nutrition, counseling and health psychology, physical medicine or structural adjustment, botanical medicine, and homeopathy are the core modalities of naturopathic medicine. So these are the additional tools that we learn and can utilize in working with individuals in addition to pharmacologic um, uh, therapies. So the clinical training aspect of the naturopathic medicine program um, as I mentioned, in the first two years, there are observation hours that you're completing. Toward the end of your, first, your second year, you'll actually be assigned uh, a clinic shift where you'll have a more active role in the patient, in the clinical encounter. So at, as a junior student clinician, you will be responsible for um, rooming the patient. So you're greeting the patient, bringing them back to their rooms, and taking their vitals. You're still going to be working in an observational role. Um, however, depending on the how that particular shift is structured, the supervisor, and whatever skills you might be bringing in with you, you may be taking a more active role, even though you're a junior or student clinician. So each shift, um, and those shifts are Monday through Saturday, is four hours long. Um, and there's a half an hour spent on the beginning end and at the end, so a total of an hour where you're previewing for your patients and reviewing. So in the preview, the first 30 minutes of a shift, the senior student clinician is introducing the patient that they will be seeing today in their individual rooms. I'm just going to take a step back here. Uh, you're supervised. You're generally in teams of two. So there will be six students on a shift typically. Um, a senior student clinician and junior student clinician paired um, in each room. So three pairs of students are together in three separate rooms, all supervised by a licensed practitioner. So during the, re the preview and the review, the senior student clinician is giving the introduction to the patient during the preview, you know, what they're coming in for, their, a brief history of what brings them into the clinic today, and a and a plan of approach for, um, for that clinical encounter. At the end of the three hours in between where you're seeing patients, we have a review for the last 30 minutes of the shift where you're again going over and giving a summary of the patients that you saw in your room. And again, that is going to be the responsibility of the senior student clinician in that um, student clinician pair. The majority of the clinical education that you have here going through the ND program is going to take place at our teaching clinic, the Bastyr Center for Natural Health. 
we also have some specialty and off-site community clinics that are available. These community clinics tend to focus a bit more on certain populations. For instance, there's a women's health specific shift, a pediatric specific shift. There's homeless women, homeless teens, a geriatric uh, community clinic shift. So those tend to, to offer an opportunity for you to have a much more broad clinical experience and work with a more diverse patient population. And so this next slide that you see is showing you some of the off-site clinic shifts and special, specialty shifts that you have um, as an option to choose from. And just to keep in mind, since we are here in Kenmore, Washington, these particular off-site and specialty shifts are the ones that are offered at our Kenmore location. So as I mentioned briefly in going over the therapeutic modalities um, slide and the number of credits that you have in each of those therapeutic modalities, here is a list, again, of those therapeutic modalities of so botanical medicine, nutrition, physical medicine that was um, uh, structural therapy in the previous slide, counseling, and homeopathy. So since these are the, the core modalities of naturopathic medicine, what this means is that as you're going through the ND program, you'll have a series of classes, both lecture and lab, that, where you'll be covering information um, in each of these modalities so that you really do gain a depth of, of, of knowledge in these areas so that you're able to utilize them as a part of your overall toolkit. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, the therapeutic order um, on our next slide here, our principles give us a um, guide us in how we're approaching cases when we actually are looking at a particular case, we are also guided by the therapeutic order. So this gives us um, a, an idea of where we're going to, where of the, of the order, actually, uh, to keep it simple, the order in which we would ideally like to start with an individual. So uh, at the bottom of the screen, I believe we're, you may not be able to see this um, because we're, again, experiencing some technical difficulties and I apologize, but it's a, a triangle. And at the bottom of that triangle, we have the determinants of health. Um, moving up in that therapeutic order, we have stimulate to the healing power of nature, then tonifying systems. Okay, our screen is back up. So you'll see where we would like to ideally, where we would like to start is by addressing the determinants of health. So those things that determine how healthy you're going to be. So in the in, included in that particular group of things would be addressing your diet, addressing your lifestyle, addressing your environment, looking at the relationships you have, the work that you do, and how those things may be impacting your health. So if someone is coming in and they have a constellation of symptoms and through some investigation, we determine that they're experiencing these symptoms because of some unhealthy relationships that they have, then that is where we're going to be addressing those symptoms through um, some using our counseling skills and some motivational interviewing, um, behavioral medicine uh, skills to help them to reframe that relationship and either you know, move to shift that relationship or you know, perhaps in some cases terminate that relationship because of the adverse effect that it's having on their health, or at least figure out some strategies and tools that they may be able to use to better deal with and cope with um, the, that other individual. So that is what we mean by starting at the determinants of health. So those things, lifestyle, dietary things that can have an impact on your health. So this, again, is ideally where we would like to start. However, someone may be a bit further along or maybe they've been under long-term stress and that has been impacted other systems in their body and we need to start with a higher force intervention. So what you will notice is that as we move from the bottom of the triangle to at the top of the triangle, we're looking at higher force interventions. So perhaps there is you know, where we need to start is by utilizing um, symptom-based natural prescriptions, so high-dose vitamin therapy or other nutrients 
to address certain symptoms. In addition to that, we're going to be working on all the things below. So we're still going to be working on the determinants of health. We're still going to be trying to simulate those mechanisms and processes within the body um, that allow for that innate healing process. We're still going to be tonifying those symptoms. We're going to work on those things at the same time, but the focus of our treatment is going to be with those natural prescriptions. Um, and in some cases, the highest force intervention here at the very top of the triangle is really referring to um, surgery. Um, and there are times, or chemotherapy or radiation, um, there are times when those are going to be our, our, our first option because that is what's going to be the safest for the patient and that is going to be what it means to do no harm. So again, even if we are recommending a higher force intervention, we're still going to be addressing some of those things that are um, lower on that triangle. You know, we're still going to be tonifying systems. We're still going to be simulating the body's innate ability to heal itself, even though they're going through that higher force intervention. Um, or if we're prescribing medications, which we have the right to do here in Washington, even if we're prescribing those medications, um, you know, the idea is that we're going to continue to tonify systems. Uh, we're going to continue to stimulate the body's own innate mechanisms with the hopes that you won't have, that individual will not have to increase their dosage of a particular medication, or they may not have to stay on that particular medication for the rest of their lives. So in looking at the next slide, what your naturopathic med doctor can, can do is very broad. Um, I use my degree in a number of ways. Um, we're actually at the previous slide. What can your naturopathic doctor do? Thank you. Uh, so what you'll find if you have been out and been shadowing with, with some naturopathic physicians or if you've been doing conducting some interviews because of your interest in this field, what you will likely encounter is that folks are using their degrees in a variety of ways. Um, first and foremost, we're trained to be primary care physicians, and so we provide primary care. Um, we have at our disposal those things that are um, necessary for us to be able to provide um, primary care to individuals. And so if we need to order labs and other diagnostic tests, then we can do that. If we need to perform physical exams, then we can do that. We collaborate. You know, we, we have that shared language with other healthcare practitioners. So when it comes time to collaborate or coordinate care, we're able to do that as well. There are some NDs like myself that also use their degree um, to teach. Um, and so there will be um, some NDs that will do a combination. There will be some that will be strictly in clinical practice, and there will be others that will do a combination of clinical practice and teaching or clinical practice and research or research and teaching or some that choose not to enter into clinical practice and just decide to teach. Um, so you're only limited by your own imagination. So whatever it is or however it is, you're thinking of utilizing this degree in the future, the sky is really the limit. Um, you'll be, you'll, you'll have a solid foundation of information and skills to go out and do literally pretty much whatever, literally whatever it is that you want to do. Um, so the next half of this presentation um, talks about the admissions requirements for the ND program. And at this time, Nancy is going to be taking over to talk more about the admissions requirements, and then we'll get into some of the questions that you all have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. McCarter. Can we have the next slide, please? So we have general requirements and specific requirements for the getting into this program. Certainly, um, we have to, we are looking for the, a person who's really motivated and passionate about wanting to become a naturopathic physician. There are things such as that, that work directly with the application, such as we need 
two letters of recommendation. One must be from a professor. A second one can either be from a professor or a work supervisor. We call that a professional recommendation. There's a personal statement in the application where the applicant responds to specific questions we've asked with um, some information. There is specific prerequisite coursework, which we'll get into. Then um, we also look favorably upon any work or voluntary volunteer experience in healthcare, whether in conventional healthcare or naturopathic healthcare. Um, we're not picky about that, but people who have had exposure to clinical practice or clinical environments, that's a very good um, background to have if you're applying to this program. And certainly an important thing that I always like to stress to people is that we want all of our applicants to have an awareness of a concrete feel for the field of naturopathic medicine. And that generally, nearly always involves either interviewing or shadowing a practicing naturopathic doctor. We recognize that in some parts of the country, it's hard to shadow someone. In fact, in many parts of the country, naturopathic doctors do not want people who are not yet um, students to shadow. And in, for those situations, we certainly are willing to be flexible and we will take an interview with one or two NDs. Sometimes it may have to be on the phone if you don't have an ND living close to you. But we do want every applicant to this program to have either shadowed or at least interviewed a naturopathic physician to find out really what life is like as a naturopathic doctor compared to a regular doctor, a conventional doctor. Everyone knows what that life is like, but what is it like to be a naturopathic doctor? There are different challenges in being a naturopathic doctor. There are different circumstances, different licensure in many cases. So that's something we want everyone to understand at some basic level. And on the next slide, we talk about the specific prerequisite courses. College algebra, pre-calculus, or calculus. We say college algebra, that's the lowest math course we'll accept, but we will accept higher level ones such as pre-calculus or calculus. At least one course in general psychology or lifespan developmental psychology. Physics, one course, it needs to be based in algebra. You have, should have a requirement of having taken algebra in order to get into that course. Chemistry, four courses with labs, science major level courses. For most people, this involves taking at least two semesters or three quarters, if, depending on which kind of program your school is on, in general chemistry where, or what's sometimes called principles of chemistry in, at many schools, and then one or two courses in organic chemistry, at least one organic chemistry course, and then the second course can either be organic chemistry or biochemistry. So Normally, all the general chemistry courses and organic chemistry courses at most schools have labs, and we do want you to take the labs. For biochemistry, some schools offer labs, other schools don't. So for biochemistry, we do not require a lab. But for the other schools, we want whatever labs your school offers with those courses. And then biology. We're looking for a full year of biology, either two semesters or three quarters with labs because it should be science major level biology and when you're taking that coursework so it's basically a year of science major level general biology it can cover cellular biology and genetics in one course or it might have you might need two courses to cover that material Often, you can take a general biology course for, made for science majors that covers cell bioengenetics in one course. And then for the second course, you could take a specialized course such as anatomy and physiology. We do re strongly recommend at least one course in anatomy and physiology for our entering students, but it's not, an, a, strictly speaking, a requirement. Then we also require a bachelor's degree from a regionally accredited institution. And then on the next slide, the next slide, we talk a little bit more in detail. Um, I've mentioned some of these things already. And so 
I just want to um, say that, for instance, we say here again, the science major level biology with lab covering cell biology and genetics. If you were on the quarter system, you would be taking, um, oh, this is this, so I, my, my apologies. This is the ND post-baccalaureate program. We have uh, a post-baccalaureate program for people who have trouble completing all the prerequisites in a, in a distinct amount of time that is satisfactory to them without holding them up for a long time from going into the ND program. So for people who want to finish their prerequisites more quickly, we have a post-baccalaureate program, um, and there is information on our website about that. But you have to have, in order to attend that program, you have to have a bachelor's degree. You have to have taken your math, whether it's college algebra or a higher level math course. And then you have to have taken at least one science major level biology course covering cell bio and genetics as well as the first two general chemistry courses that ordinarily would be taken before a person took organic chemistry. Then we do provide the following prerequisites in our post-baccalaureate program, an organic chemistry course and a biochemistry course with labs, and then two more biology courses that cover um, significant amounts of general biology, a psychology course and a physics course. So it's possible to take many of your prereqs here at Bastyr uh, while you are completing them in order to apply to our MD program. Next slide, please. So although we do have um, a priority deadline for our naturopathic medicine program every year, which is February 1st, it is not too late to apply for the fall 2018 start entering class if you have pretty much all of your ducks in a row. Naturally, you need to have completed all your prerequisites before you could start our program, but it's not too late to apply. It is um, applying by February 1st allows people to be considered for the full amount of an honors at entrance scholarship, but otherwise it is not too late to apply. Next slide, please. So these our deadlines have changed slightly. It's no longer September 1st. October 1st is now our the, de the day that our fall 19 applications will enter, will go live. So you can start your application earlier than that, but just bear in mind that we will update our application um, so that by October 1st, a night, fall 19 application is available and it's just possible that some of the some a few questions may have changed then we have an early decision deadline on November 1st which is for people who early on have nearly all of their prerequisites completed and would like to be able to get a decision very early in the year. It's not required that you apply by that deadline and it will not reduce your chances of getting in if you wait to apply. So as I mentioned earlier, February 1st is our priority deadline. Next slide, please. So if you want to know more, you can see on the left, Terrence Peterson and Shannon Rosencrantz are our two naturopathic medicine admissions advisors at our San Diego campus. And Safia McCarter and myself are the two ND admissions advisors at this campus. We would be happy to advise you. And you can see below here on this page, emails that you can easily use to contact us or you can certainly contact us directly. That phone number there for our admissions office is for our um, Kenmore campus. If you call that number, you will be, uh, we will, the people that answer that number will be happy to set you up for a phone uh, advising appointment or in person with either Dr. McCarter or myself. Next slide, please. Well, if there isn't another slide, then I'm going to start answering, uh, asking Dr. McCarter some of the questions that have come in. 
and I will let her give the answers. And let me start off, Dr. McCarter, by asking a question that's been asked uh, by a couple of people, and that is, uh, can you talk a little bit about the variations in the curriculum between the Seattle and San Diego campuses? You might be muted, Dr. Car McCarter. Well, since we can't hear from Dr. McCarter right at the moment, I'm going to talk about the differences between the campuses. Sorry, can you oh, hear me now? You. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, the the curricula uh, are identical at both campuses. Where there may be some variation, so you're going to have all the same basic sciences, clinical sciences, therapeutic modality courses. Uh, what I have seen as a difference between the two will be elective courses. Some of the elective courses that are offered here, um, they you know involve the the surrounding area. So that is one of the major differences between, other than that, the base curriculum is going to be the same at both campuses. Thank you. And another question that gets asked frequently, um, is there a way to reduce the, the length of the four-year program and take extra credits in order to shorten it to three years or some other length of time? Um, under some special circumstances, those coming in with advanced degrees, those that are that are chiropractors um, transferring from other ND schools or that are medical doctors, um, can potentially upon evaluation on a case-by-case -case basis get some of their credits waived um, because it would be a duplicate, um, inf duplicate information being taken in our program. So under those cases, and again, that's going to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, if that's not your question, sort of like an advanced standing situation, um, then as, to my knowledge, there is not a way to further reduce. It's a jam-packed schedule where you're taking upwards of 25. On average, in your first two years, you're taking 20, 27 credits per quarter, um, which is a tremendous amount of classes and um, class work that you're responsible for. Um, so the minimum that folks go through if it's not an advanced standing situation is going to be four years. And that's a year round after your first year. Thank you. Now here, um, I have two or three questions here that are related to the emotional side of illness. Um, do you work with the emotional part of illness and do you, in doing that or in doing any other kinds of treatment, do you, uh, do you work with regular medical doctors in sorting those kinds of things out? Um, yeah, so it's important that we stay within the within the scope of our practice. I'll say that. Um, so when, even though counseling is a modality, we we have some basic counseling skills or basic behavioral medicine skills that we have. Um, so we'll be able to assess and tease out whether or not it's something that we might be able to address as an ND without further training through our motivational interviewing skills. Um, whether or not it's something that we can we can address or if it's something that is going to be best handled by a mental health counselor um, or a psychiatrist, I um, mean, we will make that appropriate referral. Um, in my experience, I'm dealing with people, um, I just so happen to deal quite a bit with the emotional side because of my own personal feelings about how um, the psychosocial emotional aspects um, contributes to illness um, that is very important for me personally to address. And thus far, I've had to refer out um, on several occasions because it just has gone beyond my particular um, set, um, skill set, excuse me. Um, but, you know, in assessing it initially, I think, you know, going through the indie program as is, you'll have enough skill to address due to do an initial assessment. And then from there, if you do not have additional training, um, mental health counseling training, then it will, you will be required to um, 
refer that person out. So let me know if that did not answer your question. Yeah, I think that probably did. And there are a num uh, several other questions that might um, also elaborate on that. For instance, normally, in a, would you often work with patients who want to follow both alternative and conventional treatments? For example, um, cancer and uh, with chemo, if someone was a cancer patient, they might mm -hmm. want to get chemo, but also homeopathy. Would you work with mm -hmm. people like that? Um, in general, yes. So um, I don't personally. Um, however, you know, there's an additional postgraduate certification that you can um, you can obtain if you are an individual that wants to work with um, with cancer patients. Um, so it's a fellow in the American Board of on Naturopathic Oncology, FABNO, um, for short. So if you know that you're a person that wants to work with folks that have cancer um, and you want to really be steeped in, in how to provide those adjunctive therapies for cancer patients, then that's an additional certification that many folks will get. And you'll see that they'll have in the FAB and O at, as, as their credentials, meaning they've gone through that postgraduate um, certification process. Um, in general, many times I am either, you know, and I ask folks when they come in to work with me if they intend to have me be their primary care physician, which we can be in the state of Washington, or if I'm going to be a part of their health care team. And so for some people, I am their primary care physician, um, and for others, I'm a part of their health care team. So that means I am collaborating and coordinating care um, between myself and their conventional practitioner. Thank you. And um, what kind of conventional drugs can an ND prescribe? So for, and that's going to vary depending on the state that you're in. Here in Washington, uh, there are some Schedule three, Schedule four drugs that we can't prescribe. Um, basically, those drugs that have a higher incidence of um, addiction are outside of our scope of practice. Um, so if I, those drugs that are available to me um, that are commonly used in a primary care general practice setting, antibiotics, um, statin medications or cholesterol medications, hypertensive medications, birth control, um, we have access to all of those to prescribe. And again, that's in the state of Washington. It's going to, your prescriptive rights differ depending on the state that you're in. And um, speaking of that, can you tell us a little bit more about the, um, the scope of practice and, and its variation among the states, since that's different from a standard medical doctor? Sure. So here in the, and my ability to answer, answer this question in, um, in depth is going to be limited because I have only practiced here in the state of Washington. Um, so again, in um, we're licensed, currently licensed and or registered in 22 states in the United States. Um, so f here in the state of Washington, we are covered by major insurance carriers. Um, contrast that with California, where we're licensed to practice medicine in that state, but we are not covered by insurance. Um, so anyone, So that affects your business model. Um, your practice model. And so there are a number of everyone in California that's a naturopathic physician will have a cash based practice because they are not they don't have access to um, uh, to the insurance model. Here in the state of Washington, uh, we are, and they are still, even though we do have that access, there are still some folks that choose not to um, take insurance and just have a cash-based practice. Uh, so also here, we have autonomy over what we do. Um, in uh, Again, using California as an example, there are certain things that have to be signed off on by a medical doctor in order for an ND to do. Um, you may not have, uh, more generally speaking, you may may not be able to practice minor surgery, um, which is within our scope in the state of Washington. So minor surgery, meaning we can suture lacerations, we can remove warts, skin tags, and moles. You may not have that capability depending on what state you're in. You may not have prescriptive rights depending on the state that you're in. You may not be able to order labs or diagnostic um, imaging depending on the state that you're in. So those are just some of the variations. What's going to be best for you to do if you're thinking about working 
in a particular state or going back to your home state um, is to one, you know, look on the website for the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians, which is the national professional organization um, for naturopathic physicians. There's going to be some information there um, for license regarding licensed states. Um, and if you are and know are in a licensed state and you want more information, then the Department of Health um, or the Board of Physicians um, is going to be the best place to get more inf specific information about your particular state regarding the scope of practice for naturopathic physicians. Thank you. Um, now, as far as research, does Bastyr, do you have, do we have research and investigation labs for studying and trying new alternative treatments? Um, there are research opportunities available. Generally, what happens is folks either come in with an interest in pursuing research or they have a background in research. Um, generally, folks are going to be, we have a student research center, um, and if you're interested in research, then you will meet with the director of the student research uh, center, and he will then pair you with um, a PI that is conducting research. If you're interested um, in potentially doing some original research, that's a, there's a different route that you can take with a, a different lead. Um, but the first step is going to be going through the student research center um, to figure, to sort of tease out and clarify what it is you're interested in doing um, and what's going to be the best route for you to take. So the short answer is yes, it just depends on what you're coming in with and what you're interested in doing. Thank you. And then for international students, is there an online program that international students can, can take? We do not. This is a, um, you have to be in residence. This is a residency program. So you have to be here in order to um, matriculate through our program. And speaking of residency, can you talk a little bit about naturopathic residency programs? Are they required? Do they follow the same pattern that allopathic residencies do, which is usually three or four years after graduation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, that's going to depend. Um, so first, first off, residencies are not required for licensure for Indies, with the exception of the state of Utah, which requires a one-year residency for any Indie that's going to be licensed in that state. Um, otherwise, residencies are an option. Um, they are an option at this time because they're privately funded versus being federally funded as they are for DOs and MDs. So there are far fewer that are available that are open to all Indies that have graduated from a, a CNME accredited uh, naturopathic program. Um, so they are quite competitive to get into um, because there are a few number, high number of, of grads. Uh, the, the length of the residency is going to to depend on the residency site. So there are some residencies that are one year, others that are two year. I think on average, um, they are between either one or two years, depending on where you're um, on the site that you're in. There are some that have a mandatory or a minimum of two years, and those tend to be those that are more specialized. Um, so if you're going into a women's health residency, it's most likely going to be a two-year residency position, um, or if you're going into a pediatric, so either population or disease-specific um, versus a general practice, um, tend to be two-year residencies versus one-year residencies um, for a more general practice. For example, here at our teaching clinic at um, the, the Bastyr Center for Natural Health here in Kenmore, we have six first-year residency positions, two second-year residency positions, and one chief resident position. So you can go through the first year of residency and then be done at that point, or you can choose to continue and apply to be a second year resident and then also apply to be the chief resident. So you can have a one, two or three year residency experience at our teaching clinic. Thank you. And I've just noticed that we are out of time. So I know that uh, there are several questions we weren't able to get answered. I will make sure that the people who sent us those questions get their answers to those questions. Uh, we will do. We will get in touch with you as soon as we can to answer your questions. 
thank you for attending our webinar today and please do feel free to contact us directly at any of the emails listed or by contacting our admissions office also the numbers listed on the last slide thank you very much for attending thank you all so much